ESA timetable that we will follow very roughly. Um, so we did have this course once before, um, but we did we have made significant changes and the timings are not at all exact. But essentially we'll talk uh, start with an intro to Julia, the basic syntax, and we'll talk about functions because they are very important in Julia. And once we've done with functions, in fact, we basically have all the everything that's special about Julia mostly covered. Um, there's things that exist in all modern languages, but not in um, many compiled languages uh, like package manager, managers and so on, and testing that we will also cover um, tomorrow. But yeah, the, the basics will be basically uh, will, will be covered today. Um, so here's about copying, cloning the materials, and then there were instructions of how to install Julia. And I asked you here to run these commands. So if you didn't do that yet, please do that um, now. So if you have installed Julia, you can go to any command line in your system and type Julia to run the Julia interpreter. And it should look something like this. So it gives you a link to the documentation. And it also tells you how to um, get some help for running things in Julia. Uh, let's go away from here for a while though. So I am actually in the um, intellectual materials folder. The lecture materials. Um, yeah. So there's notebooks, solutions, and there's a data folder. So if you are in the correct folder, you should see data notebooks and solutions and some um, some other files that we will mostly go to a bit later. Um, this other option, well, oh, okay, let's first go through the main option. So you run Julia, and then I have already run um, installed the iJulia package, which means this shouldn't take long. So I will run the commands anyway. So if you type using package PKG, now you will be able to use the package package, a package called package, whoops, package. And then in, inside this package, there is this package.add, which installs stuff. Um, and if you, if you ran, um, ran the lines in the lecture materials, you uh, saw what happens. So this time though, it will not install all that much. It will check if there is something to install. Might take a moment. Okay, so uh, it is in fact fetching something. Okay. There is an update since yesterday, which is interesting. Since yesterday at 10 in the evening. So Okay, no changes. Mm -hmm. So what this will, um, this will install some files into your system and you can see from here basically where, um, where your Julia packages are. So where the Julia files are, that's useful information. Um, and now we should have iJulia. So just like we started using the package package, we can also now start using the iJulia package. And by the way, this is all standard Julia code. So you could put this into a file and you could run that file using the Julia command. Now we are using the interpreter for the interactivity, but also just to test things. Okay, but what we'll be actually using for most of this course is the um, notebook interface. This is um, what you will see in a moment is Jupyter notebooks. So I'm typing different things that I'm saying, and I should never do that. Um, so the notebook function is in the iJulia package. When you start using the iJulia package, you get the notebook function. And we are running the function with one parameter, the directory or folder include, uh, equals this one. So we will start the, uh, the notebooks in this folder. <clears throat> 
prints a bunch of stuff. And there we go. So I want to move this to the side. And it opens this notebook interface, which again might look a bit different if you have a wider. Actually, it looks mostly the same. Um, I should have mentioned this in the beginning. So I'm, I am sharing a kind of a vertical um, window, and that's on purpose. So you should be able to open. Um, oh, you see this screen share in a window and open your own notebook or um, your command line or whatever you want to be using um, on the other side of your screen, even on a small laptop screen. Hopefully you can use half the space for seeing my screen share and the other half for working yourself. And the basic idea is that you type along more or less everything that I type. So if you don't have the notebooks open, let us know in the um, in the HackMD or in the chat. These over there. Okay, I will not open it. Um, but if we are all fine, then let's go look at the notebooks. So the notebooks folder now contains all of the actual chapters in the course. The first one is an introduction to the course, which we have already started a good while ago. And, um, and then it contains an introduction to how the notebooks work. So again, we have a markdown like in the HackMD. So there's a couple of different types of cells. If you select the cell here, you can choose the type of cell. So it can be code or it can be markdown or two other options that I never really use, heading um, and raw content. Raw content is just text. So if I change it into code, it will now think it's Julia code. So let's change it back to markdown. When you run a markdown cell, um, so one way to run a cell is to click here. When you run a markdown cell, it just displays it as markdown or as um, formatted text. Okay, so the uh, learning outcomes, these are not necessarily super ambitious because they are what we expect everyone to get from this course. Um, so don't be discouraged if you want more advanced stuff. Um, but um, what we really want to get across for everyone is the basics of how to write code in Julia, how Julia works, how it's different from some common other languages, and then where to look for more information. So there is there's a lot of packages for Julia. Whoops, when I double click, it opens the cell. Um, so there's a lot of packages and um, it's easy to write more. So it's um, the main thing beyond the basic syntax is knowing how to find or how to look for packages. Okay, which is mostly Google. So I mean, it, it's um, the documentation. Uh, finding the documentation is the most important thing. Okay, the target audience is mainly beginners and intermediate students, but people who already know programming in some language. Um, if you don't know any, any programming language, um, hopefully you saw the link in the email or in the course page to um, some. Um, to this software carpentry programming course, but um, I mean, you should be fine. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask in the chat, uh, in the um, HackMD. Or the, um, the Zoom chat is also fine, but the HackMD is easier to respond to. There's also some advanced stuff. So um, you shouldn't get bored. Okay, so um, throughout the course, we'll go through this simulation of an epidemic um, to tie everything together. So we will write a um, we will write a Julia package essentially by the end um, of the course that runs a a relatively simple simulation um, 
and plots uh, creates an animation of how the simulation of, of how how an, an epidemic spreads in a population of plants and um, Okay, this is what should be in the notebook. In this GIF. Okay, so um, in this in this uh, simulation, there's a bunch of it, it's a two dimensional grid of um, of plants. I'm calling them plants, essentially only because they don't move and. Um, they, the disease will only spread vertically and horizontally, so um, they don't, they they never visit each other or anything like that. Um, in a more, um, in a better simulation of an epidemic in humans or in animals, you would need to have them move around. But um, this actually does uh, work surprisingly well to simulate an an infection in basically any kind of population. So. Um, in animals, it would look very similar, um, the curves here. So you get first, um, first essentially an exponential growth, and then it will um, turn back and then taper off when there's nothing to infect anymore. And in the beginning, you see that there are some immune plants here. So adding more immune plants or changing the, the other parameters, um, how easily it spreads and how long it takes and so on. Um, those will, of course, change the results, but they will keep the overall pattern the same. So this is what we'll write, and we'll write something that produces this, um, this simulation, uh, this animation. This looks... Correct. If you try it, you have the kernel not to trust it. If you click trust that. Not trust it, okay. And it loads the page. Okay, and now, it's, now, yeah. now it works. Good, thank you. Okay, so some general remarks about Julia itself. Um, I didn't mention all of this yet, I think. So. Um, yeah, Julia is a high-level language. It's a modern, basically a modern programming language. Uh, so a lot like Python in that you can rather quickly write code that works and does what you intend it to do. Um, it has dynamic typing and, um, well, the functions are dynamic in the same way as in Python. So, but um, also important, the functions are quite different, which we'll come back to. Um, but it's intended for numerical computing. So, or at least that's one of the main use cases. So it's fast. Um, so whereas Python is intended to be um, high level and simple, Julia tries to take as much of that as possible while keeping it as fast or reasonably close to as fast as C or uh, Fortran or any compiled language. Or C++ is probably the best comparison. Um, and it achieves that by essentially um, using a function as the scope for compiling. So in when you write a C program, you have to compile it once and it takes the entire program and compiles it or in C++. Um, you compile the entire program in one go and then it basically needs all the runtime information or it, it needs all the information in order to be fast and if there is any runtime dependencies, um, some types are defined only at runtime, then it will need to do a lot of checking and it will be a lot slower. Um, so if you are used to those compiled languages, you can think of Julia as being something like Python, something that is basically dynamic and not compiled, except whenever you go into a function, it will compile that function and everything that depends on it, put that together into a program and run that. So it's like a C program from, from there on. And this is really sort of, it's convenient for the compiler because most of the time, almost all the time, 
it will know all the types when going into the function. It can just compile it and go, right? It's um, so it's relatively easy to make it fast. And at the same time, it's really convenient for the programmer because um, you don't need to care about the types that much. Um, it's dynamic. It's just, it uses duct typing. You just write a function and hit go and it works um, because it figures it out all in the runtime. Julia is also free and open source. It's under the MIT license. So it will be there um, forever, basically. When once something is under MIT license, if you have a copy of it, you can keep it forever and you can make any branches and so on. There's no restrictions whatsoever. Um, multiple dispatch is something uh, we'll get back to, but it's basically the way it handles um, calling these functions with different types. And um, well, it goes beyond that. It basically implements everything that object-oriented programming can do and a bit more than that. So, but it sort of follows naturally from having to compile all the functions, which, which is kind of cool. Um, so it uses dynamic typing, which means that um, you can assign any type of object to any variable. You don't need to declare the types to start with, but you, of course you can declare the types if, um, if it's useful. I also already mentioned it's um, sort of intending to achieve C-like performance and it gets there. Um, it has a built-in package manager, like any good modern programming language. Um, and then there's metaprogramming facilities, which um, we'll probably not spend a lot of time on unless we have time at the end and you want to. Um, you can call Python code, C, Fortran code, and many other languages uh, directly from Julia. And um, you can define your own types, which goes into the multiple dispatch thing. Um, it doesn't have objects like C++ or Python, or it doesn't have classes, but um, you can define your own types and then define functions for them. So it gets um, basically there and a bit further than, than object oriented if you, um, if you use those features. Okay, so I mentioned the MIT license. Um, it's, um, and I also mentioned that it compiles the functions. Um, for this, it, it uses an LLVM based compiler. LLVM is um, also, it's basically what CLang uses to compile C and Fortran and C++. Um, but of course it, it needs to be changed a bit to compile Julia code. Um, but yeah, LLVM is kind of convenient for this extension. So it's, um, what many languages use. Um, so I say sort of performance comparison, you can go to, to the details a bit more on your own. Um, it's um, all um, compared to C, so C is one, and then other languages are sort of all over the place. So Julia is in most things pretty close to C and um, the variation is not much more than in something like Fortran or Java, Go, and so on. Okay, now Python, um, this is not as unfair as you might think, uh, think because they are actually using libraries like NumPy here. Um, and well, these are relatively low level tests, so they are actually mostly comparing to what you would do in Python if you were using it properly. All right. Um, and then there's a bit about uh, the Jupyter Notebooks, which is exactly what we're looking at. Jupyter is for Julia, Python, and R. Uh, that's where Jupyter comes from. So uh, Jupyter is um, in the iJulia repository, which um, we installed already and run. That's the, the other option. If you're in Alta, you can use the CS computer science notebook interface um, to run Julia. And then, well, if you're in Alta, you have the, uh, the work folder, the, um, the cloud folders, and you can put the, um, the, your um, notebooks there and they will be accessible to you. So that is useful. And you know, probably other universities, CSC has a notebook interface and probably other universities do as well, but um, I can't really tell you where it is or how to use it. 
Uh, okay, so now we get to the point. Oh, we, we actually get to where we are running and writing some stuff. So I will actually stop, share, stop sharing the, the notebooks themselves because the idea is to type along. So I will start a new notebook. So from here, and I will choose Julia. Here we are. So to run Julia code in, in SL, you just type the code in and you can run it from here. Like I already mentioned, it will take a while to start the Julia interpreter and when it's when it has started, it will run. You can also press Control and Enter to run it. Um, let's move this for demonstration. Um, so when you run here, it will create a new cell below. When you press Control and Enter, it doesn't. Shift and Enter will create a new cell or move to the existing next cell if, if it exists. Alt and Enter will create a new cell. Um, if you're on a Mac, this will probably be different, so play around and see what works. Um, but you can also always create a new cell by clicking the plus here. Okay. If you run two different commands, um, or you just have them on two different lines, and it will print out the, um, the result of the last one. And you can prevent it from printing out anything by adding a semicolon at the end. So then it kind of looks more like C uh, when you start adding semicolons. Okay. Let's create a markdown cell also to demonstrate next thing. So what did I just do? Sorry. Um, I did something to get rid of a cell that I wanted to see in the other. <laughs> okay, this is kind of annoying. Because um, you can use later, but now I don't have an example of how to use later in the notebook. Oh well. Um, here we are. Is it frozen or? Uh... No, it's just that I um I tried to open a cell with Markdown in it and it deleted the content. Oh. And I can't find how to get get it back. Um. Okay. Fine. We'll get back to back to later if we have a chance. Let's see if this works. Okay. So it, it's obvious enough that I don't need anything to remember how to do it. So you just put in inside dollar signs, you can put any uh, later equations and it will work. So this is in, um, in this uh, Jupiter markdown cells. Okay, um, so there's a bit of more of these magic commands that you kind of just have to remember. So you can run shell commands in the um, in a notebook by starting with a semicolon. So it will now ls lists the contents of the current folder. And this is what we have. The untitled IPython notebook is uh, is this one. Let's add a new cell. Um, we can also run, well, I mean, we can run another command, um, print working directory. Okay, there we are. And finally, in Julia itself, um, so when, in, when you put in a cell, um, you put the string, for example, it will print the last statement. So it prints the cell. 
if you want to print something in between or if you're writing a script that goes into a file, you might want to use the print command. Now, print doesn't add a new line, print ln adds a new line at the end. So you usually want to use print ln. Let's show, demonstrate, print um, i, and remove it from there, like that. Print new line. This is a new line, okay. So yeah, print doesn't add a new line and print ln does. And one more thing. So these also all work in the um, in the uh, Julia interpreter. So when you type Julia and press enter, you can type in any of these commands. And this is especially useful. So starting with a question mark and typing a function name or the name of any other object gives the help string for that object. But this tells us how to use this function. And with print, it's basically the same, except it doesn't add a, it doesn't actually say much about adding the line end. Okay. But it does tell you that there is a print, print ln print styled and s print for if, if you really like the um, the c style versions there's also print f um, and then the rest of that kind of match print don't really okay so let's close this notebook oh no sorry we are at the end of the first section but of course i don't want to close my notebook. I just want to go to the notebooks folder and open O2 Julia, which is essentially um, the basic syntax of Julia. So there's a lot of stuff there and the plan is to go through this quite quickly. Let us know if you don't know other programming languages because um, if everybody does or if most almost all people do, we can sort of run through this and there will be a break. There will, also, there will be exercises, um, but there will be a break relatively soon. And then if you are... Um, kind of lost, uh, we can talk more in more detail.